live. Do yeah. you, are we doing this live? Yeah. And then do you, do you edit the podcast or you just put it out? To an extent, like suppose like you, you do have like a 20 minute hot cough and a keck, I, mean, I would take that out, right? <laughs> right. But most like, you know, some stuff I leave out, you know, I leave okay. it in there. It has to be something that, you know, greedy, just so to speak, you know. Cool. All right. So ready to get started? Sure. All right. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Brett Green. Brett, are you ready to be great today? Yeah. Brett Green is an executive, co executive coach, community builder, connector, and promoter of cool things, covers tech entrepreneurs and executives with ADD, HDHD, creates strategies, support, and structures to be happier, less overwhelmed, more effective, and more successful. He himself has ADD. ADHD, holds an MA in counseling psychology, and has coached, mentored, and advised hundreds of, of executives. Some of his clients were leaders at companies that were acquired after the leaders were coached by Brick, including a Fortune 10 acquisition. He is a founder CEO of the New Tech Northwest community of 60,000 plus technologists, where his members and clients include startups to Fortune 10 companies. He has, he has produced hundreds of event experiences, worked with multiple platinum bands, and has, been, and has been a top 35 social media power influencer on Forbes and has spoken to the White House. Brett, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jason. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And um, it, it, it's, it's awesome to be with somebody who's, you know, been in our community and, and, and been really active in the Seattle tech community for, for so long. And um, it's great that you're doing things like this along with the other things you do that, uh, I know they're, they're good for you and your business and they're, they're good for the community and, um, and, and inspire and share the, the great things that are happening that, that people are creating. So thank you. Thanks for it. That means a lot coming from you. So let's start off. How did you build a, how do you build a stop tech community? Like how did you build new tech Northwest to where is that right now? <sighs> That's a small one to start off with. <laughs> so uh, as, as I mentioned uh, before we came on with my ADHD, I might ramble. So if, if the story's going long, you can you can pull me back. But um, I I think it, it's good to kind of start at the beginning and also give props to the the people who have kind of macheted their way through the forest before me um, to to make the pathway for what we created here. Um, so when I was seventeen, I was uh, started as a DJ in a college community radio station in Las Vegas, KUNV. And I ended up being a music director and a program director there in the late 80s, where I was, um, besides just doing stuff in the community and community building around music, and you know how passionate you are about music when you're, you know, especially a teenager, your early 20s. And it was, it was the late 80s, and it was underground rock, punk rock, those kinds of things. And I was bringing, like, Jane's Addiction to town two years before they had their Warner Brothers album, and we had 2,000 people. Um, for a 500 person <laughs> venue. Uh, I mean, you had the dream job as a teenager, right? Uh, who wouldn't like I, kill to be a DJ at <laughs> that age, right? I, and it makes me a big believer in fate. There's, there's a lot of things that have uh, happened that I can be really grateful for that were not on my radar. They weren't planned. And, um, you know, people in circumstances just showed up to, to make some, some wonderful things happen. So in hindsight, I can look back and I only mention this because that was my first community experience. And, I didn't know how much I loved that and how much it mattered to me until I got a job at Geffen Records and moved on um, onto the, the record label side of the business, which was, it was a lot of fun, great things I did, uh, you know, in my 20s with that. It's, it's fun you know, going on the road with rock bands and things like that, but, um, but definitely not fulfilling and, and very challenging career-wise, which in hindsight with ADHD, could look back and go like, oh, okay, that's that's why those things didn't work out, and that's why I kind of screwed that thing up or so we lost want, that job. We, we, or whatever we, it was. I, I want to ask you about any of the debauchery you saw on, on the tours. We'll leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I could tell lots lots of stories. So one, are you? I mean, I have ADHD and I'm not linear, so I can jump all over the place if if you're okay with that. I'm good with that. Okay, yeah. So if if you're good with that, um, give me one second. Okay. I'm gonna drink a lot of water. Um, so one of my favorite 
uh, stories is just Ramones to give them, you know, props. Um, they, they only had money because Johnny Ramone was great with business and, and took care of them. And so when I went on the, I was their promotion guy on, on the, the West coast national, but there was a New York guy. Then we kind of like split things. And so when they did stuff, I, I went out with them and um, took them to radio stations and, you know, brought people to shows and stuff. And so I was in a van with the Ramones for a few months. <laughs> and, and I remember asking him, I'm like, what, this is like, a van with me, the band, the tour manager, and the roadie slash merch guy. And it was like, I don't know, 90, 1993, probably. And um, I'm like, why, why do you guys, why are you still traveling around in a van with, with the U-Haul in the back with the equipment? A U-Haul trailer had their equipment. And um, I'm like, why don't you guys have a, a van? And Johnny, um, who was a kind of an angry, jerky guy, um, very the opposite of, of Joey, but still had a good heart, um, said, what do you, cause we're not stupid. We're not paying $10,000 a week for a freaking bus to be cool. This is our money. And, um, and he was really, really smart with money. So, so part of this, the, the, the two things that Johnny did that were probably the best things in the world for the Ramones. And it's just actually a good, good business thing to think about when they first went out in 1977, and they knew they were going to be touring a lot. And they knew that's where they made their money, um, not on record sales. They actually have only, they maybe have, their greatest hits may have gone gold. But um, I remember there's a point where that even still hadn't happened. So kind of like the Grateful Dead, they didn't sell records, but they could put, you know, 5,000 people in a room. And, and that's where they made all their money. And so in 1977, Johnny um, made a deal with Holiday Inn and said, hey, if we stay in your hotels every time we go out, um, will you give us a 50 buck a room rate forever? Because we're in a van together all day long. And when we get to the hotel, we need our space. We need to do our thing. And so Holiday Inn in 1977 made that deal with the Ramones. And we were on the road in 1993. And they were paying $50 a night to, you know, so everybody could have their room every night. And then they'd use the van. So they weren't wasting all this money on a, um, on a bus. And then they would call me up or the road manager, the manager would call me up about, um, you know, a day or two before I'd go out to see him and remind me they wanted me to uh, go through every department at MCA records and grab every poster that was there for the Ramones. They didn't care if it was supposed to go to a record store or a radio station or, or where it was supposed to go that was theirs and, and they wanted their posters. And so I'd bring the posters out and before the shows, while they're warming up, they would warm up and then Johnny would line them up um, with Sharpies at a table and take the posters that I brought from the record company and he'd have every band member sign it. And then they'd run, somebody would run the posters up to the merch um, and they would take all those posters and they would sell them for 50 or 75 bucks each because they were autographed Ramones posters. And, um, and so they would make money off the posters that the record company decided to how to spend the money. Right. So they, but it comes out of the band's, uh, account and they have no say over it. So that was kind of their way of, of getting that's, that's genius. So, yeah. <laughs> but, but I could be wrong. I mean, I mean, they have the, 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 the saying starving artists for a reason, right? Like most artists are not good at business. Right. So that's great that he was good, good no. at business. Yeah. And they, and they, when I met them, they, they even said, they're like, we wouldn't like own apartments in New York. We, we don't know what we would do if he hadn't have said, no, we're doing it this way and made sure that everybody's money got put away so that when they weren't on tour, they were going to be okay. I mean, cause when you see all these like older artists, like touring, like the casino scenes and stuff, like there's probably a reason why they're, they're touring like 60, 70 years old, right? Cause mm -hmm. they're somebody wasted the money or they won't go with the money back in the day. Mm -hmm. Right. And the Ramones um, also are noted for being the first band to make merch a thing like other bands, they might've, you know, had some merch, but um, they were really smart about creating a brand and um, creating a demand and making it cool to have that brand. That's nice. So, yeah. So, so back to building a startup, <laughs> a startup community. So you moved from 2006. 
Right. So, yeah. So I had um, I moved to Boulder, Colorado, in two thousand, and um, or well, not in two thousand, like nineteen ninety six. But in two thousand, I left the record industry and I started a digital marketing and promotion and got into that world. And then um, around 2005, 2006 is when I probably went to my first New Tech Boulder event. And- um, So there's a New Tech in Boulder too? Yeah, well, well I'll, I'll, so history, um, hold on a second. I always get dry when I talk, sorry. Uh, so, so the history of New Techs in general is that in, um, after, um, the Twin Towers went down. Um, Meetup was born, I think, a couple months after that to try to bring people back together. And I think it was about six months into it that Scott, the founder of Meetup, um, looked at his co-founder and said, oh, we have this Meetup thing. Maybe we should have one <laughs> since, you know, since this is our business. Um, and they created New York Tech Meetup, which exists now. So that was 2000. So that was, you know, October, November of 2000 was a meetup was born. And um, so when I was in Boulder, somebody who had gone to the one in New York had brought it to Boulder. And when I first went to the Boulder one, there was a uh, new tech in San Francisco. Uh, that's why I was shocked. It wasn't in Seattle. When I looked at moving to Seattle, I'm like, how it's been in Boulder 11 years and nobody's done yeah. this. I'll be honest. I didn't know, I didn't know it was anywhere. I just thought it was like a Seattle organic thing. No, they're all over uh, the country and beyond. Um, and, you know, Canada has a, a few, two, which now have been rolled up into one. And um, so they're either called whatever the city is tech meetup, or they're called new tech, whatever the city is. Um, so, you know, New Tech Boulder actually was there a long time before they expanded to, to Denver and Port Collins and other places um, there, but just like regular meetups, it's just, you know, it's a meetup. So it's just, you get a sponsor to cover beer and pizza um, kind of thing. But the Boulder one had, you know, we had 400 people every month and the uh, um, university donated the space. And so they just had a sponsor uh, who would, you know, cover $500 for appetizers and beer and wine for people to have, and it was free. So that's, but when I went there, it, it was the punk rock experience all over again. And it, people who weren't around for, you know, the, the, the 80s version of punk rock, people think of like, ooh, punk is, you know, these jerks, whatever. The thing about punk rock is, is and this is the, the same spirit of new tech, is everybody's welcome. And the only people that showed up were the people who were into it and everybody's cool to each other. And there were, there were some things like the rockabilly guys and the punk guys because they were young and had testosterone and would, you know, like to fight here and there, but overall um, everybody's just supporting each other and they're being creative and they're thinking they're going to change the world. And then, so in 2006 in Boulder, I go to new tech and I'm not a coder. I'm, you know, I, I have a master's degree in psychology. I'm, I'm a people person. I'm, I'm a promoter. I'm a connector. And I just love to help people. And I walked out of the first one and I, I was like this, I just felt amazing. And I have, I'm like, this is the way I used to feel when, you know, when we had our music scene. And, and so that was the beginning of the startup scene was like, you know, 2005. And, um, you know, out of that scene came tech stars and, um and other things that startup weekend there's there's a lot of things that started in boulder that you know people don't realize i went to the very first startup weekend when andrew hyde created that and um and, and tech stars actually started in boulder too right right mm -hmm. yeah yeah people forget about boulder there are things up with the bay area and you know seattle austin but boulder has yeah. like has like a lot of history yeah and at the time you know us in boulder it was like boulder san francisco boston that was really you know where anything was kind of happening um, but community wise, there seemed to be more going on and there was, well, I guess, I guess all three cities, you know, were had communities coming together because they were just, you know, they're passionate. They, you know, they'd wake up, people would wake up and want to code and, you know, drink too much Red Bull and not get enough sleep and, um, be excited about what they were going to create that was going to change the world. And this is, you know, pre Facebook making a ton of money and it was before the gold rush and, 
again, it was, you know, like the early days of punk rock. If you were there, it's because you were into it. And, and these were your tribe. These were the people you wanted to hang out with. And people are bouncing ideas off each other and um, companies that look like they should be competitors or helping each other out because they also know most startups fail. So if I'm cool to you and my startup fails, you might hire me. And, you, you know, or you might bring me in as a new co-founder. And that's how things are going to work in Boulder back then. And um, so when I moved to Seattle, um, I just kind of put a word out on, on Facebook and said, hey, I'm going to move to Seattle. Um, I just want to meet people who are cool, personally or professionally. And um, someone connected me to um, this guy who was doing hackathons for AT&T in Seattle. And um, he was you know, kind enough to do a Zoom call with this guy he didn't know. And then um, he's like, look, you just, you need to talk to Red Russick and Rebecca uh, Lovell and you're done. You know, you're good. And I'm like, well, would you ask them if they talked to me? And he's like, sure. And they both did. And, um, and I thought, you know, all three of these people are like, you know, I'm, when I come, I'm a community guy. I'm not just kind of looking for a job or what I'm going to do or, you know, come to a new city. It's about how I can give. And, um, and I'm going to bring new tech there. And it turned out that Red, who was pretty much like the concierge of startups in Seattle at the time, um, he's like, dude, I went to the one in New York and I've been squatting on the meetup name and I have 150 people signed up to nothing <laughs> and I don't know what to do. And I said, well, I'm going to do this and I would love to do it with you. Um, and you know the people, you know what to do. And so, um, so we did. And, um, and Rebecca actually helped me um, get a job at a, there was a company she was on the board of. And when they were looking for somebody to do business development, marketing kinds of things, she connected me with them. And that ended up being the job that got me to Seattle. And um, I started, you know, Red and I talked in June of 2012. I moved in October and, um, like the first week of January, we're like, okay, what do we need to do? And we launched our first event in February. Um, when what we did that, that was the secret, when you say, how do you build, build a community? The, the secret is to go find like-minded communities um, that you can help them and they can help you and you figure out how you can help them. And um, you work together. So you don't, you don't start your own thing and work as a silo. Um, what I did with Red is I said, look, if you set up these meetings, you know who to talk to. So, so make a list of the top 20 organizations in Seattle that deal with startups, set meetings, and just let me talk. Not that I'm so cool or anything, but I knew I could go there, show them the meetup pages for Boulder and New York and San Francisco and say, look, this is ours to screw up. And all we're going to ask you guys is if we write something up, we send it out to your email list, let them know about it. And um, if it fails, no one's going to know. And if it succeeds, we'll, you know, we'll give you free sponsor tables or whatever we can do to help you guys out. We really appreciate it. And they understood the whole goal of what we were doing was to raise the tide for all the boats. And that's another part of the secret to our success, success is that New Tech Northwest is about everybody else besides us. It's not about us at all. Um, Seattle has such a fertile ground, an amazing ecosystem of great people, creative people, and organizations doing cool things. And the way I've always described myself, which I would also say with New Tech, is I'm a tank. I, I, I'm a fuel tank with unlimited fuel and a giant fire hose, but I do not carry one match. So, and not that it's bad to help people start out. That's just not my thing. My thing is I see something, I'm like, wow, they're doing something special. And part of my superpower is being able to see who they should be talking to and who should know about what they're doing, because it's going to help both people take that next step on their journey, whatever that is for their career or company. Um, that's what excites me. That's, that's what I love. That's, you know, why I built it and, and it's gone. So when you come to new tech, the expectation is, you know, our, our motto is what are you up to and how can we help? And we, as anyone in the community, and, you know, from going to the, you know, what I'm saying to you now, you know, I yeah. stand on stage with a microphone and say it to people directly intentionally creating that container of like, Hey, 
you should feel like the new neighbor on the block. You came to the Saturday barbecue and people are going to just going to be cool to you because you showed up again, that, that was the punk rock atmosphere. And, um, you know, you're considered to be a cool person until you prove otherwise. <laughs> and, um, you're expected to be curious about other people and you're expected to share what you're up to. And if you can help each other out, cool. And if you can't, hopefully you, yeah. you met a cool person. And then, as you know, we do things, you know, there's like an hour of beer, wine appetizers and connect with people with some good music because I was a DJ for a long time. <laughs> and, uh, and then an hour and 15 minutes of the show, which there's nothing in it that's more than five or 10 minutes long. And there's parts in it where people are interacting with each other in the room. And there's parts where you're learning cool stuff from the people on stage. And we are not a pitch event. We are not competition. Um, we're about community. So, um, you know, nothing against that. There's plenty of people who do pitch stuff and it's, it's great. And they're good at it. That's not our thing. Our thing is making everybody equal. Another thing I'm sure you heard me say over and over is the, the sponsor, it doesn't matter if you're a sponsor, you're a presenter, or you're an attendee. If you're in the room, we're all the same. Yeah. And we're all, we're all just here to share our stories, um, see if we can help each other take that next step. And um, the fulfillment is in people, you know, now I, I've helped hundreds of people get jobs, find business partners, find companies to partner with. Some people um, in the beginning, uh, the first couple of years, it, it got back to us. There were people calling this new tech hookup. <laughs> so, um, that was kind of fun the, fir the first couple of years. And, and there were times when we were like, hmm, you don't usually see, you know, girls in short skirts with lots of makeup coming to a, a tech event. Um, but there were people that met people that they were dating, you know, they would end up dating. So, um, yeah, one thing like too, like all your events at the beginning, you would like say, if you have like an announcement for the community, you, you give everyone like two minutes, right? Get up, say what you want or what you need. Right. I thought mm -hmm. that was great too. Right. Yeah. Because again, we want, um, you know, you have to show people, you can't tell them. Um, so we show them we're, we're here for you. And, and the we're is not me and our team and the volunteers that help us out the the we is yes that and everyone else you know we all 60,000 people in the community that we we try to be really clear this is what you're you know I say signing up for it's free you know get on our newsletter join the meetup group you're part of the community and um but the spirit of it is all hey tell me about the cool stuff you're doing and be interested in the cool stuff I'm doing and let's see what we can do to help each other out. And if it doesn't happen today, it might happen in six months or a year. You, you just, you don't know where stuff's going to lead. So Brett, how did you decide to go from Seattle, like Tacoma, Bellevue, the different cities, Portland, how, how did you decide that? And, and when do you, you're like, man, like I'm like 60,000 people, like this mm -hmm. is going crazy. Like how, how do you, how do you um, sustain that growth and not let it overcome you, so to speak? Um, well, 60,000 don't show up for an event, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, at an event um, pre-COVID, we were generally like 200, 300 people a month at our peak in uh, 2018. Um, when we were at Cornish Playhouse, we had uh, 500 a month. And, um, you know, people come when they need it. And, that, and that's kind of the whole purpose of what we do. I'd have people who said, oh, I haven't been here in two years. I'm really sorry. I'm like, why are you, you there's nothing, no reason to be sorry. Like, that's, the point is, you know, we're here. You know what we're about. You know, when I need that thing, this is where I can go. You know that, you know, and we'll probably do a different timing now, but, you know, we were like the second Tuesday of every month, it's in Seattle. The third Tuesday of every month, it's in Bellevue. If I want to go have that experience, meet those people, if I want to get a pulse on what kind of new technology people are creating with their companies and um, just talk to people about what's what's happening to kind of get into the, the trends of, of what's there, I know I have a place to go do that. And it's a, it's a place that's safe, that's supportive, and it's fun. Um, you know, it's very important to me that people leave feeling higher and better than when they walked in. And um, I think we, you know, most of the time, hopefully almost all the time that happens for folks. And so it's, it's just kind of there for them. So the 60,000 number isn't, you know, that's people getting a meetup uh, note. Okay. or, or uh, getting our newsletter. And then whether they show up, you know, the day and the time have to work for them and 
you know, all those other factors. So that go into it. So the other cities was just an extension that Seattle was very full. People were asking about the other cities. So we, um, so we, you know, tried Bellevue and there was a demand. Some people like to go to both. They would go to Seattle and Bellevue. And then Tacoma always seemed a kind of underserved. And um, the interesting thing with Tacoma is, I don't know what the number is now, but um, as of like 2018, I think, I think the number was about 15 or 20,000 engineers in Tacoma, but very few companies. There are companies, but not that many. Um, so again, it was a way to have those people be able to meet each other, help each other out, share what their, what's, what's going on for them, and, and just a place to create community more than anything else. And, and I got asked... Um, you know, to do it in LA and to do it in Detroit and, and moving around. And I just thought about it that, you know, there's other things that expand out like that. And like I said, I, I was in Boulder when Startup Weekend started and Andrew Hyde, when he started that was really young, single, wanted to go around the world, set him up around the world, gave him places to crash and friends to meet all over the world. He had an amazing experience. Um, he was also the first community manager ever at Techstars and you know, eventually, um, you know, Startup Weekend was bought, um, Techstars bought it from someone else, but, you know, it was actually bought uh, by Seattle guy, um, Mark Nager, who's awesome, and now in Telluride doing stuff with um, people in Boulder, and um, it, it was, it fit him, you know, it fit him and what he wanted to do when he did. And so for three years, I kept thinking, do I want to go to other cities? And I thought, I don't want to manage people. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to deal with when somebody sees a shiny object and they leave and I got to find somebody to replace them. And, and again, the new tech model, I didn't invent this. You know, I, I, I started new tech Seattle and um, with red and technically in 2012, our first event was 2013 the seed of all of this happened in 2000. So, um, you know, we're around 15 years later than San Francisco and Boulder and a lot of other cities. So um, there wasn't a real need for that. And I didn't, I didn't, it just wasn't where I was at. You know, I have a family and I, I didn't, traveling, yes, but traveling to manage that stuff all the time, I'd rather be with my family. So great. Was there like a, do you notice like a different vibe between Seattle, Bellevue, Tacoma, Portland? Like, is there a different vibe or is there a whole, the tech vibes the same in each city? It's, it's a little, it's not, it's not a lot because it's all Pacific Northwest, you know, and Pacific Northwest kind of has this coalition. So there's definitely some different flavors to things, but um, we're all kind of swimming in pretty similar waters. You know what I mean? It's not there. Yeah, they're a little different, but it's not, not. And it's and it's crossover. So when we did New Tech Tacoma, more than half of the companies that presented there came down from Seattle and Bellevue. So it was more in the spirit of you know how does each city kind of support what the other ones are doing? And we also have um, an affiliate in Portland that you know we support what they're doing too. And um, so the whole idea is just again rising the tide. So, you know, whatever makes sense to, to do that. Yeah. So, Brett, since you had to know those new tech Northwest, there's Founders Live, there's, you know, Bunker Love, there's all like, it seems like there's literally hundreds of startup communities, right? Mm -hmm. And this is my opinion, like sometimes they don't corporate enough, you know, like some like they just stay in their silos, right? They do mm -hmm. their thing here, you know, pay tickets, whatever else. How do we like bring more corporation to Seattle startups? I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, the thing is, people are heads down on what they're working on. You know, and, um, you know, we, uh, we partner with a lot of different organizations. Um, we've done stuff with WTIA and GeekWire from day one. And um, so, you know, we'll co-promote stuff. Um, and we, we have a community calendar that promotes the other things that are going to town. So I kind of see that as our role. Like each of these organizations, they kind of need to know who, who am I and who am I serving and what's my mission our, our mission that's a little different is to be that hub. And that's another reason why when I looked at other cities, I'm like, you know what? Seattle's been great to me. This is my community. This is what I love. And um, I know people that have gone wide. Um, but I also know that that doesn't, if you look at the organizations that went wide that are successful, um, they're almost all backed by 
nonprofit. So they're, they're not, you know, like startup grind, um, and, you know, startup weekend now, um, they're, I guess startup weekend is not nonprofit, but, um, the Kauffman foundation and Google entrepreneurs support a lot of those things, but I was, I chose to do new tech Northwest as, as a business. Cause it's what I wanted to do full time. Um, which is a different model than if you just have a sponsor that can cover the basics, then you don't have to worry about getting sponsors. You don't have to worry about covering costs or making more than costs. And um, so it, it really depends on kind of what business model you, you're you looking that you want to create. But does that make sense? It does. So follow up question. Like there's a lot of startup community stuff here, right? Mm -hmm. How does a new startup founder right, find the right community for them? Well, that's why we have the community calendar. Um, so I would say, you know, look at the calendars um, that we have and GeekWire has. And, um, you know, you have to attend events and talk to people to see what they go to and what and what kind of works, which again is what our whole purpose is with our in-person events is to come and say that, say, this is the kind of thing I'm doing. And then you know, people would say, well, this would be the best co-working space for you, or you should go tr check out this event, or you should do this thing to see. And you, you just have to kind of explore to see. Um, and again, that's why we made the hub and, um, and try to have a place where people can just look at the calendar. You can say, oh, WTIA exists. Oh, Startup Weekend is a thing. And you can learn that those things are there. Um, so that we can kind of have a little bit of a, a central way. And we also have a ton of resource pages with those things. And we even have one that's like, you know, events we think that we like or, um, you know, co-working spaces. So actually on the newtechnorthwest.com website under resources, we have like 20 things and there's stuff like uh, women and girls in tech resources and um, anti-racism uh, and diversity in tech resources so we try to highlight those kind of things to be um, kind of the, you know, the, I don't want to say yellow page or Rolodex because <laughs> that's, that's yeah. way old, but I don't know what else to call it. Yeah. Anymore. So this question for you. Uh, and I think some entrepreneurs go overboard network, networking, right? Mm -hmm. Like what, what's the, what's your advice? Like having a fine balance with networking and building a product, right? Cause you're networking, you go on every single networking event in Seattle. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can build a product, right? But then if you're building all your product all the time, not meeting people, right? So how, right. what's your advice for that, find that balance? Well, it really depends on kind of where you're at in, um, in building into what you need. So if you, I mean, I, I would say it's, it's good to, I guess if you want to just go with the regular 80, 20, you know, spend 20% of your time networking. So the, it's not, what's important is the cadence and to keep that muscle built it's not about, you know, how many. So if you just went to one thing a month, but you're doing at least one thing a month, then you're kind of in that habit. And you're getting people see, you know, if you're doing it once a month, people are going to see you at least once or twice a year. So you're going to be top of mind where they could help you out. Um, the other great thing now is, you know, we're also used to virtual events that you can, you could go to meetup or you could go to other places and discover virtual events and virtual communities that are specific to your industry or the type of product that you're creating um, to, to kind of find people even outside of just people you're going to meet at a in-person event in, in Seattle or Portland. So how do you handle this? Like I've done events before, right? And people say, Hey, Jason, great event going, you know, great, good job. In my mind, I'm thinking that's wrong. That's wrong. I messed that up. This over here. Like, how did you control that? You know, like, how do you deal with that? You know? Um, just the way I do it is just listen to it to, to understand and then consider whether I think I need to switch something or move something around. Um, the other part of it for me is again, that's why I kind of like start out with the 17 year old DJ thing. Uh, looking back now, I can see, oh, well, you know, before I was 19, I had, you know, produced over, you know, about 50 concerts. So, you know, I, I was behind a microphone on the radio station and I was on stage with, you know, nine, nine inch nails and the red hot chili peppers and Jane's addiction and all these 
you know, bands when they were first starting out, um, that that was comfortable for me. And it was because I was, the thing with me is it's not about me, (laughs) which I guess I realized, and that's what I said about New Tech earlier, is it's exciting for me to connect people to something I know is going to turn them on and is going to, going to add value to their life. So being in that position, um, I guess I've unconsciously looked for those things. So now if I go back and look at it between things with the radio stations, things when, when I had my own DJ company for years, um, and then now 10 years of new tech, I, I don't know how many events I produced, but it's probably over a thousand. So I, you know what I mean? So part of it is muscle memory of it's, you kind of know what things to look for to see what's out of place or what, what did we not have here yet? Um, I still have a hard time if, you know, there's 300 people there and one person didn't have a good time, but uh, there's only, you know, so much you can do. Um, But I think it's always good to listen to people to, to know, because there's always things we don't know that we don't know. And um, the only way to, to, provide value is to be a better listener to understand what the experiences people are having rather than thinking, Oh, I created this thing and somebody's having a totally different experience. Um, but you still think what you do is cool. Yeah. That's not going to be good for anyone. And that could be, he could have been having a bad day all day anyway. And just, yeah. So when you were doing these events, is there a certain like time where you're like, okay, this event is going to go off well, or like is it when the event first starts, you're like, okay, everything's in line. I'm good. Or, how does that work? How does it click? Okay. I've done everything I can do. Everything's straight. Everything's good. Um, no, never. never. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that, I mean, you know, I don't know, you know, you want to segue into the ADHD stuff, but I mean, that's, that's the other part of it is um, that the interesting thing for me is uh, I'm an introvert and I'm, and I have ADHD, which doesn't sound like a guy who would get on stage in front of thousands of people. Um but I'm also driven by giving that experience to people to I'm, I'm a gatherer of people. Uh, you know, I'm a connector, promoter, and a gatherer. And, um, so I actually have a lot of stress. Um, the hour when people show up, I hope they're having a good time while they're drinking beer and wine and talking to people and hoping they're meeting the right people. And I, if I see people, I think I could introduce to somebody, mm-hmm. then I kind of look for that. And the second I go on stage, um, I'm full of anxiety the entire time. Um, And, but I, you know, love what I'm creating for people and I, and I love what I hear happens for them. And then when it's done, um, then, you know, people want to go to the after party and I want to go read a book, (laughs) sit down with my wife or, or walk my dogs. And I, um, so, and that's kind of the introvert part of it is I, I, there's things I really love about it, even though I'm full of anxiety the entire time about, cause I'm expecting things to, you know, screw up or, or not be, you know, good enough, or maybe I'm going to say the wrong thing. Um, but, um, I need to get rejuvenated. I don't walk out with energy. Some people yeah. walk out, you know, the extroverts yeah. walk out and be like, wow, I networked. It was awesome. And I'm like, that ah, was awesome. And now I need to go get my energy back yeah and I, i've said some podcasts before like i love doing the podcast right but every time a part of me wishes the, the guest does the show right but I do the podcast, podcast right yeah it's probably Maybe like you know the me. first step somebody takes on stage every time yeah. and, and you hear like you know musicians who have done it for 40 years and they say yeah that or comedians and they're like that that first step on the stage or right when i have to walk through that door every time you know that you know the the butterflies and the anxiety hits and he it's it's kind of an out of body experience sometimes yeah like um, like whenever i speak in public for bunk calls other places like i always rehearse and practice right and then i'll talk i hardly ever remember what i said you know but it's like yeah it's out of body experience for sure i was looking forward to this and as soon as you're like okay are you ready to go and you started it then all of a sudden that that hit me i was like oh wow yeah we're doing this thing and it's live <laughs> and uh you know, I hope what I have to say is helpful for people and I hope I don't say something stupid. So back to the Seattle startup scene, mm-hmm. from your time being involved in the Seattle startup scene, what are some good things and bad things about the Seattle startup community? Things that maybe or can get better, can improve and things that are going well? Um, well, the best thing is that overall, 
Seattle, my experience with Seattle is that overall there's a very collaborative attitude. Um, we'll see how things are now opening up and coming back. Um, I will say that, you know, from when I got here in 2013, um, as Seattle got bigger and a lot of people came from other systems or other states that have other systems of, um, and cultures that got less and less. And so I, I've always kind of part of new tech for me is being a culture warrior of, Hey, we're here for each other. Um, let's be here for each other. And, um, you know, tech in general turned into a gold rush mentality. So, um, and that was even pre crypto. So now after crypto, you know, it's big time, um, what's in it for me. And that's always going to be there. Um, so I, I guess if I could change anything, I would lower <laughs> the what's in it for me um, attitudes and, and raise more of the how can I help or how can I give. Um, I honestly believe that attitude is, is easier. It's more fun. Um, it creates more great things. And I, it's just kind of a better way to live. But um, there's people who that's not as that's not their method of operation. So, Brett, you know, it's not like there's like 10,000 people in Seattle who like want to give advice, right? And of course, all advice is not good advice. Mm -hmm. What's your advice for startup founders like they try to like go through all the clutter and, and mud, so to speak, and, and decipher all that stuff and pick what's right for them? That's a huge question, Jason. <laughs> um, it's so it, it can be so unique to the founder. Um, I guess my, my, my main piece of advice would be to do research on what, you know, groups and organizations they might want to be a part of or events so they can connect with people who have already kind of walked down the road and, and get good advice from them. Um, and, and really, do whatever you can to make fewer mistakes. They're just, they're going to happen no matter what. Um, but again, I, I really believe in fate and I, and, and I feel like, you know, the old saying about if you, you know, just, I can't remember the exact saying, but it was something like, you know, 80% of life is just showing up. And um, I would say that about people coming to events or going to events, but I think that's just in general, if you, if you found one thing every day, that's, taking action towards that thing, all of a sudden you're going to be introduced to a certain, per certain person, or you're going to happen to see a certain article on the internet. And when you put things out, you know, you're attracting those, those other pieces that kind of fit. It's kind of like you, you send a signal up going, this is what I'm interested in. And so it's like, oh, okay, you might want to see these things, but the founder journey is so different for so many people. And there's a ton of books, there's a ton of websites, there's I think the best thing is communities because you can get varied experiences. Like you said, you're going to get 10,000 different pieces of advice and we're all limited by the experiences that, that we've had. So um, we all only know, you know, these certain pieces parts, but if you're talking to more people, then you can start to kind of see patterns of like, oh, well, if five people have said that thing to me, I should really pay attention to it. If I had only one piece of advice to give a founder, it would always be to whatever product or service you're thinking about, figure out who that target market is and go talk to that target market about what their biggest pain point is and what they really want. But so many people don't Doesn't, do that, do they? No, almost nobody does. And and this isn't, I mean, this is stuff I was, you know, reading in the 80s that is still true now. Um, it, and there's people like Dan Kennedy who were giving, you know, seminars for, for years and years on how to be an entrepreneur and how to create products. The biggest mistake still, it's never changed. The number one mistake that founders make is getting excited about their own idea and getting married to it. And then that means they waste their time and their money to go create this thing they just know is awesome. And then after they did that and they've gone through whatever pains they went through of like not having enough money or it took three years longer than they thought, then they 
put it out to the world and get mad because nobody cares and say, oh, I made this awesome thing. So as soon as I put it out to the world, I'm just going to have customers. And it's like, that, that's not how it works. And there's also, you know, hundreds or tens of thousands of examples of fantastic products or fantastic services that served a deep need for a large group of people and they didn't buy it because they didn't want it. And um, even though it can be proven that it fixes the need, there's some weird thing about want to need in our, in our brains um, that we actually will put money down for. So the question is going, figure out the people that you really care about that what whatever that group of people is maybe it's like oh i have this product for skydivers and okay well then go talk to skydivers and talk to at least 20 or 50 or 100 skydivers and say hey what are like the top 3 things that you're having problems with or that are pain points for you around skydiving and then go look at the top one or two things that they all said and if you can fix that then you have something then as soon as it arrives they're like, oh my gosh, I have to have this. And, and, you know, there's also that cliche and cliches are usually true of somebody going, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And then they go create something and then, oh yeah, all the other parents that had that problem are like, somebody finally created something to fix this. So, you know, if you have that personal issue of keep saying somebody should make this better, go ask people like you in that category if that's true and there's a good chance it is, then that's what you should do. But wasting time and money. Um, you mentioned to me before that we came on here that um, you got accepted in founders Institute and I've, I've been a founder Institute mentor for, I don't know, um, eight years or something. And the thing that's amazing about the program, the whole point of the program is don't quit your day job while you're trying to figure out your thing. And so, you know, come through this program that is, that's one thing I would say is if you, if you really want to be a founder and you think you have something, Founder Institute is one of the, the greatest ways to kind of test um, whether or not you have anything, whether or not you're going to stick with it and you really care about it. Because the thing that most founders don't know when they start out, especially ADHD founders, is how hard it's really going to be and what those obstacles really are going to be. So you might think, oh, I have this great thing and I'm going to love it and it's going to be awesome. And you don't realize that if you can get to the third step of that, all of a sudden there's all this other stuff you have to do that you hate, that you don't want to do. And um, this is, I'm going to say this because it's popping up into my head. So it's not, not totally a founder thing, but it is. So there's um, a school for kids that, you know, high school is not really their thing. Um, and they, they go to this high school, it's a little more experiential and they have them focus on, you know, what are you really passionate about? What do you think you really want to do? And so part of what their schoolwork is, is to actually go apprentice in that and do it. And um, there was a, a girl who had loved, like, since she was like five or six years old, was like, I'm going to be a baker. I'm going to, I just love baking. I bake all the time and I'm going to have a bakery. I want to have a bakery. And she got in that school and within one month, she gave up the idea of ever doing a bakery because the one thing she never thought about with a bakery is turning the ovens on at three in the morning and starting to prepare everything at four so that you can start selling it to people at six. Pretty big and detail, she was like, pretty big detail. I don't want to get up at three in the morning. I'm like, well, then you probably, maybe you want to make baking products and, you know, sell them in a cafe or a grocery store. But as far as owning a bakery, you can't own a bakery if you're not going to turn the ovens on at three in the morning. And so there's things like that that I think people just don't, you, you know, because you don't know, right? We don't know what we don't know. And you have a great idea and you jump into it. And there's things that you just can't know until you do it, unless you talk to people who have already walked that road or something really similar, they can say, oh, these are kind of the pitfalls. These are the things I wish I knew when I first started out that would have made it a lot easier for me. So, Brett, just not for fun for everyone in, in general, talk about how we need to get used to hearing no, right? So many people hear no and they like shy away, they, their feelings get hurt. Like talk about you need to be mentally strong enough to hear no over and over again. Well, you just said it. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you can't be, you can't be an entrepreneur 
or a founder if you don't have resilience. Um, and you have to have that real passion for your idea. If you, if you want to do something because you think it's going to make you money, you're going to fail most likely because no matter what you do, there are hard times and there are speed bumps and there are curveballs. And if you have a passion for what you're doing and that turns you on and lights you up and that's what you want to do, then when those things happen, you're going to turn that obstacle into a bridge and you're going to go, huh, okay, wow, I thought we were going to do this, but there's no way to do it. And you're going to find your way around to do that. But if you're just doing it for money, once you hit that third or fourth obstacle, you're going to give up. And, and the number one thing that helps entrepreneurs be successful is resilience. And um, there's a, a curve, actually, I was just reminded of this the other day. And I, don't, I don't remember exactly, but if you look up Seth Godin, you can find um, this curve of um, how we get really excited and we have our honeymoon phase. And then there's a giant dip. And this is like when you're starting a business or a new relationship or whatever it is. And when you hit that dip and you drop off and you don't know how long that's going to be. And most people give up when they're in that dip. It's called like the something, something trial or despair, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. So, and you know, that's one of the main characteristics of successful entrepreneurs. And, and you talk to people who have five, you know, they failed in three or four businesses and they're on their fifth because they, maybe they were, or they were resilient in general, but there was a point where they realized, oh, this thing's not going to work. And so either I keep trying to push Boulder up the hill or I realize that I need to go do something else. Yeah. So, you know, good, good follow-up question. Everyone says, you know, don't ever give up, keep on going, keep on going. But when should a founder like, you know, either pivot or stop all completely and do something else? I can't answer that. <laughs> it's, I, you know, there's, there's 10 million different answers for that because I think it's really personal. Um, but the key is to be honest with yourself and, you know, and, and be transparent about what's working or what's not working. And, and if there is a way to make it happen. Again, if you're passionate about it, you might come up with some things that just weren't ever possible. Um, and, you know, and there's, there's always things that are possible now that weren't possible five years ago because of technology or new ways of thinking or whatever it is. So I think if you're really passionate about it, you're either going to pivot into something similar or you're, you're going to, you know, find a way to make that happen. But, um, the other thing is most businesses fail because of lack of cash flow. So sometimes you don't have a choice. And um, you know, if you don't make the right decisions to manage the cash flow, then that decision gets made for you. Yeah. Um, but it's it's always gonna be kind of unique. And and again, you've you've mentioned learning from other people and having a group, you know, build your own communities, um, small and large, with peers, with mentors. Um, there, the, that's when I got attracted to the startup community, that was why again, that it was like the punk rock scene, because when we would go to something in, in Boulder and you see it in new tech here, you know, we, we have people at new tech from fresh out of a boot camp, people who are recruiters, people who are marketers, people who are C-level Amazon, people who are investors and you've got that whole different group of people to kind of pull from, to get ideas from. And, you know, the, the angels or the investors who work with lots of companies might be able to tell you more than one founder you're talking to because they've worked with dozens of companies. And if they're at a firm, they have worked, you know, they, they between them and talking to their colleagues, they've worked with hundreds of companies and they talk about the patterns and they talk about the systems that work. and you know, because startups in general have been around now for close to 20 years, again, there's, there's tons of books like Dave Parker's um, trajectory startup book. There are organizations like founder Institute, the knowledge is out there. Um, so to find the blueprints that work, the systems, the um, kind of pitfalls to watch out for that information's if 
you're going to spend the time to research it, then um, you can figure that stuff out. And it seems like the most successful founders are the ones who have no ego, they're humble, they're willing to learn. The ones who like kind of, kind of struggle, like, oh, I know it all, and they don't want no coaching, right? It seems like a big, big, big uh, discriminator, so to speak, to a good one, successful and unsuccessful start people. Um, yes, and there, I mean, there's, there's a lot of dirty little secrets in the startup community, like other things of what kind of clicks kind of help people out. And, you know, you say that, but um, if you think of, you know, the tippy top, if you think of, you know, people like Bezos and Elon Musk and, and, and Zuckerberg, they came from wealthy families. They went to yeah, they didn't big exactly, schools. They, 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 they didn't had, exactly booster out. Right. They had, they, they had the connections and the resources and, and the financial means to, to do something really well and to fail more often if it, if it wasn't going to be there and to, you know, be in those circles of the people that could do that. So for those of us who that's not our pedigree, um, you know, we have to build our own communities and our own um, peer groups and, and people to help each other out. And those people, the people that have had those extra opportunities and that level of, you know, privilege and doors opening, a lot of them are venture capitalists and they may be founders. And the good news is, at least in Seattle, most of them are really great people and they're really generous and they're really helpful. So even if that's not your background, um, those people can help you out. Um, you know, you might not have the same resources, but they know things and they're willing to introduce you to people if they think you have something that's worthwhile, you know, for the people that they know. And, um, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule, but I think in general, we, we have a very collaborative, supportive community of really smart, creative, awesome people. And um, there's always going to be selfish people. And there's always going to be selfless people. And that's just the mix in anything. But I think we have a, a decent enough, high enough ratio of the folks that are collaborative in their mindset and um, that actually enjoy success more when it's with other people. That that's one reason why I love swimming in this water versus some other city that may not be that way, where it may be more um, cutthroat and shark oriented and you know, who's, who's got the bigger this or that, um, trying to rip each other off. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not gonna say that isn't here, but I, yeah, I don't hear very much of it, if, if at all. So Brett, you, you've judged, judged some pitching competitions in the past, right? Mm -hmm. So you're judging these pitch competitions. What makes you say, you know, that's a good pitch, or I, I would invest in this pitch, or, what, and then what you say, well, this guy is not even ready for this level yet. He needs some more coaching or, you know, well, you ask great questions and they're, they're wide. <laughs> they, they have a lot of answers. So it, it depends. I mean, I, uh, I, I, you know, judge the South by Southwest competition for a while and that level of, I mean, that's, that's, you know, a, that's a big leaks right there, right? Yeah. That level of vetting, um, to, so I look at about a hundred, around a hundred companies a year with that. And um, then there's things like the UW Dempsey startup business competition. And um, there, there's a lot of different business competitions that I've helped with. And I, I mostly look at it as how to give feedback to help people on that, that next step. Generally, if you're accepted into some kind of competition like that, there's something there. Um, and there, there's something to at least look at. There are people that don't have that, like they're not ready. So like maybe they, they're in the competition and it's just them and they've got this idea and they, they don't have enough traction yet. Um, but if they worked on what they need to do and they came back in three years, they might have a co-founder and a couple of people on their team and some, um, pitch competitions that they won or some awards that they won or some grants that they got or things that kind of show 
the progress. So the, the main thing, I guess, is if you look at the criteria that pitch competitions judge on, those are the things that startups need to focus on. So there's things like um, the kind of things that I look for is whether there's really a market there, if they haven't proven it yet. Um, you know, if you've already got customers and things are happening, obviously there's something there. So it's a matter of what are the best steps um, to kind of make that happen the fastest. So, you know, there's, there's traction, there's the um, history of the co-founders and the board or the mentors that are supporting it. So you, you kind of see their education and what companies they've worked with or worked for, um, which, which isn't always tell you a lot. So some, it might say, oh, they worked at Amazon. And so you see Amazon and you think it's a great thing. And you don't think in the back of your head, oh, well, Amazon has how many employees? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that could be a great thing, but you don't, you know, totally know. Um, but there's, th there's like five or six factors that are the main pieces that I think if you're looking at systems to create a business, those are the things they focus you on anyway. So it's, it's like, okay, well, what are you doing to get funding? What are you doing to prove your product market fit? What are you doing to um, get your pricing together? How much goodness is it? That's, that's one of the things I love about the South, what South by Southwest um, pitch judging is one of the things, you know, people, we give up to five stars for these different categories. And one of them is goodness. Uh, you know, this is actually, you know, beneficial to the world and it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, you don't have to have that, but it's, it, it's a lot more interesting and appealing to have that baked in than uh, just having a product. So I think I put this off your LinkedIn profile, but mm -hmm. there was a survey done and 72% of founders said they were concerned about mental health. Mm -hmm. How should founders be taking better care of themselves? Again, great question. <laughs> <laughs> Tons of answers. Uh, What's great now is that self-care and mental health are talked about. You know, now we, we admit it. And, you know, there was a time when, um, you know, not so recent or I don't know if I'm saying it the right way. This might be saying it the wrong way, but, you know, in the not so distant past, I guess, um, where you know, there were founders starting to come out and talk about the depression that they had and the issues that they had. And there's founders like um, Tony Shea from Zappos who um, took his own life. And on the outside, you're like, huge success. Like, what's going on there? Um, so the, the good news at this point in time is that we talk about it and we admit that's a thing going on. And obviously, now it's for everybody. I mean, not that it wasn't for everybody before, but we all have whatever we have personally going on um, or because you're an entrepreneur there's that plus all of the collective um, trauma <laughs> that, we're, that we're all dealing with um, politically and sociologically and ecologically and um, everything else. So I guess, you know, this self-care, the first thing is mostly just to figure out what's going to work for you and um, what kinds of things let you kind of decompress and 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 revitalize you i've i've meditated since um i was like 10 just because my dad was a meditator and got me into it then um some people that work some people it's yoga i mean the things that i would say everybody i think kind of already knows i think it's the big deal is to actually schedule that time and treat it like a meeting with um a client or your boss that you don't blow it off that that meeting with yourself is really important, whether it's just that you're going to take a bath or get in a hot tub or go to the gym or meditate or whatever it is, um, that you have that daily or um, every other day so that you have that place to center because we are living in these, you know, mental hurricane times. When there's something that's, you know, mental disorder, that, that's a whole other layer. And, you know, what you're talking about is... Um, a study showed that if you if you're an entrepreneur, you're 300 times no. If you have ADHD, you're 300 times more likely to become an entrepreneur. And 72% um, of entrepreneurs have one or more mental health disorders. 
And when I say disorder, I don't mean it as a negative thing. I mean that there's an order that we consider harmony and it's off from that. Um, and then 29%, so almost a third of all entrepreneurs have ADHD. And most people with ADHD have one or more disorders. So usually if you have ADHD, you have one or more of like dyslexia, um, uh, depression, anxiety, or, or s some other things that are kind of mixed in there. And one thing I'm, I'm really surprised isn't talked about that much um, that I'm wondering if it'll end up, I'm going to make a big deal out of it as I kind of build my coaching career around this. But I think the seed of the ADHD issue, the, some of the, the biggest aspects of ADHD that create arguments with other people and misunderstandings and frustration for the person with ADHD come from um, RSD, which is uh, now, of course, I'm blanking because I'm my ADHD is thinking of five things at one time, um, rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria. And the two main aspects of that, um, and a hundred percent of people with ADHD have this, which is why I don't understand why this isn't what's really talked about is um, constantly expecting to be rejected. Like I said about getting on stage or doing this with you. Um, that's constant. If, if I'm awake, you know, since I was a little kid. And um, so that's, that creates imposter syndrome, um, low self-confidence. Um, if you have ADHD, um, you were probably told every single day of your life since you were some, you know, young, young, young age that you're doing things wrong or that um, why don't you do it this way? Um, you're a really smart person. Why you do these stupid things? And um, that, as you would guess, kind of wears you down. Yeah. <laughs> Not a good, so, good, not good for your right. self-esteem. And that's a big part of RSD is, is that, and, um, and defensiveness is a big thing and that it comes up. That's, you know, something that I couldn't figure out. So I, I pretty much figured I had ADD most of my life. Um, and more than 20 years ago, somebody, a friend of mine whose son was on Ritalin gave me a Ritalin pill and, um, said, well, why don't you try this and see, I think this might help you. And I took it on a Sunday and within 50 minutes, I just couldn't believe what happened. And I thought, like, wait, people, wait, people's brains work this way. Cause you only know your brain, right? So you just think everybody's going through the same thing. I'm like, what it is like, I, I can focus and I'm calm and like, wow, this is totally different than every single day. And I got more done in four hours than I get done in a week. But at the time, I really didn't want to be on medication the rest of my life. And I didn't want to have a daily, you know, medication thing. So I blew it off, which if I would have gotten a diagnosis, then I probably would have helped a lot of pain. Um, that took up to when I actually got a diagnosis a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, through that time, there's, there's jobs that I lost. There's, like I said, with career, I could never figure out these things that seem simple, but I have all this anxiety around them. And I'm always worried, is my boss happy? Is my boss not happy? Which again, this is why you become an entrepreneur. <laughs> the biggest reason is because then you're not, then you're worried what the client's going to think, but it's not quite as constant as what your boss is going to think, or am I going to get fired? And I actually have a, a client who mentioned that the other day when we were talking about stuff, he, says, he said, I, I realized you know, now he's been through like five startups and, and these things and, and, and he's 52. And he said, I realized that I, I didn't become an entrepreneur because, you know, even when I ran companies, there's issues that happened that made them fail or it wasn't good. So it wasn't that this was what I was awesome at, but I didn't have to worry about getting fired. And so at least I was in control of, you know, trying to figure out the next thing. So the other thing with RSD is, um, that, you know, so you're worried about being rejected all the time, which is a big deal. And then, um, I'm sorry, now, now I'm, now I'm blanking out. Um, 
there's one, one other major part of it that I'm just, that I'm, I'm not realizing. But anyway, th these are the things that create the biggest relationship problems, whether it's personal relationships or with bosses that create arguments. Um, the, the easiest way I can explain ADHD to somebody who doesn't have ADHD is if you imagine talking to somebody who is from a really foreign country to you. So imagine if you got dropped into a country that they speak a language you've never spoken. Um, they wear totally different clothes. They eat different foods. They have their meal times at different things. At, you know, different times of the day, they, everything about their world and their culture is different than what you do every day that you always do. And you got dropped into that. So that's an ADHD person. So we live in a world that was created by atypical brains with systems for atypical people. So when somebody with a neurodivergent brain is doing things the way that come naturally, that atypical person doesn't get it because you're judging them based on this system that doesn't fit them. So it's kind of like if, if I came from somewhere and you, you know, we're, we're hanging out, we just met and you, you know, we're having lunch and you say, why'd you dip your French fry in mayonnaise? Like, I, wait, you asked them for mayonnaise for use ketchup for French fries. Like that's crazy. Like stupid. Who would do that? I was like, well, where I come from, that's how they do it. So it's, it's things, you know, that, that's the easy way I can try to explain it is that it, it's kind of having your, a certain culture, but the dominant culture is very different. And so from the outside, some, some people will see an ADHD person and say, you're lazy, you're not focused, um, you're distracted. And the truth is there's kryptonite and superpowers with ADHD people and their superpowers like hyper-focus that if you give someone with ADHD something they love, they're going to dive into it. They're going to put blinders on. They're going to solve problems you didn't even know existed. They're going to see connection points you don't even know exist and then find the patterns for those and go, oh, you should do this. So again, entrepreneur, because you're, we're great at solving problems. We're great at innovating. We're great at seeing a problem and going, and, and just by nature, wondering about it and being curious about like, how could that thing be better? And what could we do? And like, oh, if we took this thing over here and put that thing over there, then it would be there. But from the outside, what you see is, oh, that guy's selfish. That, that, that guy is like, he's totally not being social and he's too into his thing. So, so it's horrible for personal relationships because then your you know, romantic partner is looking around going, well, I'm not getting any attention. So, and, and the classic thing with ADHD is that the hyper-focus in the relationship goes way deep for like two or three months. And so that person feels fond over there. Like, oh my gosh, nobody's ever treated me like this. This is amazing. And then after two months, that initial thing, again, think of entrepreneurs with a new idea and a new project, you dive into it and it's the new thing. And you get into the third or fourth month and it's, it's starting to get a little bit routine and it's not this new shiny object. And then they're like, whoa, you bait and switched me. Like, who's this guy? This isn't the guy that was doing all this stuff with me. And it's not intentional. It's because if you have ADHD, you have your executive function is literally 20% of what an atypical brain is when you wake up in the morning. And with executive function, we deplete it all day long. So if you have ADHD, you could be out of executive function by 10 a.m., depending on what you're doing. And, and then in working memory, those are, you know, the two like main things. And so short-term memory isn't great. So then people are like, well, we talked about that three days ago. What, what do you mean you don't know? And we're not good at organization and planning. But as far as an entrepreneur or an employee, if you get that person, a partner, who's great at the things ADHD people suck at, they're going to be amazing. Because if they're spending their time doing what they're amazing at, you'll get results you cannot get from an atypical person. They just don't have that capacity. So it's, it's, so we have more capacity with, you know, being hyper-focused on things that we love and, and things like that. But then when it comes to organization, planning, getting the books together, those kind of things. And that's why a lot of entrepreneurs fail. They don't have a 
partner or a you know co-founder or someone on their team or virtual assistant that can help them with those things because they're going to end up saying, oh, well, what's what's fun to do and what I'm awesome at is creating this product. So I don't know, we'll figure out the bill thing later, which you can't run a business that way. <laughs> Uh, you, you might not know this. Do you, do you know what percentage of the U.S. or the world is it, it has this? Um, they say eight percent of the population, but when you think of population, that's millions. Mm -hmm. It's millions of people. Okay, and then and uh, and a lot of it's not diag and, and that's that's diagnosed. So so you know, there's people like me that in, if I I didn't choose to go get a diagnosis until you know two years ago. Most people who have it don't even know they have it. They're they're walking around thinking, you know, second guessing everything they do, like, oh, the way I do this isn't the way other people do it. And um, I don't, you know, this part of my job I feel really incompetent about. So, and we also overproduce. So, like if you read like what you read about me in the beginning, like if, if I look at myself on paper, I'm like, wow, that guy's really impressive. And in my head, 24 hours a day. I'm like anxious about the stuff I know I'm not that good at or that I'm trying to figure out how to do. And so we overproduce in certain areas, but we still are not confident. And no, no matter, there's like, there's not, you know, a certain level of anything that, that gives that, except medication can, you know, kind of help. And then actually acknowledging it, knowing it, and then setting up systems. And that's what I help people do is um, have them, with, with, with what I know and what they share about themselves, together we create support systems and strategies. It's like, okay, I know I'm really bad at this, but we know that the way you help with ADHD is systems because that's, you know, Steve Jobs famously with the black turtleneck and that you, you limit your choices. So, you know, he wore jeans and a turtleneck so he didn't have to waste brain power in the morning doing that. You know, they'll write about saying, ooh, he didn't waste brain power. It's like, no, it's because it gave him anxiety. He didn't want to stand in the closet and be freaked out every morning going, which kind of meetings do I have? Who am I going to see? What would be the best thing to wear with that person? And um, so there are systems that can, you know, kind of cut out the things that are obstacles that make things more frustrating. So what goes into being diagnosed? Is it like a, some kind of psychological test you got to take? They do like DNA blood samples. Like what goes into being diagnosed? Um, you can take, if you just Google it, there are a lot of self-tests that you can just get a general idea. But to get an official diagnosis, um, there are therapists who do it. Um, you can go to your general practitioner or doctor. And if you want, if, if you would tell them that you want to be diagnosed, a lot of general practitioner or doctors work with a therapist. So the, the general practitioner will not diagnose you, but they usually have a partner that is a therapist who does do that or psychiatrists, you know, can diagnose and write medication. And again, the, the thing that I think people really need to look at is um, the RSD and, and, and it's different. And actually, um, you know, most ADHD medications are amphetamines, which, um, you know, sound like speed in this big thing, but, you know, I, I'm talking to you right now and I, I'm in on Ritalin that lasts all day. So you can, Tell them not like that. I get speedy, you know, about things that I'm passionate about. But um, but the RSD, um, what they prescribe, and I don't even know that has I have to look into this uh, myself. Um, there's three different um drugs that they talk about, and one they use since the 60s that it's great, but there are certain parts of it, um, there are certain side effects, like certain foods that you shouldn't eat and you can't get anesthesia and you can't have cold and antihistamine medications, but there's two others that because of what these medications were norm were um, first created for was for low blood pressure. Um, they just realized as a side effect, oh, it actually like turns that part of the brain off for, you know, the, the RSD and the, that, you, you know, beating yourself up. Um, in your mind. I could be wrong about this. Wasn't that controversy like a long time ago where doctors were giving Ritalin to every kid for every little thing or something like that? Yeah, there was, and there's still, um, there, there's an issue now. There are a few different um, online companies that say they can diagnose and prescribe. And that's, there's a controversy about that. Just trying to figure out 
um, you know, how are they preventing the bad actors? I guess you'd say. I mean, the first time I wanted to get a diagnosis, I went to a nurse practitioner and I, you know, filled out the 12 pages or whatever. And we sat to talk about it. And she treated me like I was um, a drug dealer. And, and I'm like, and that was another reason why I waited a couple more years before I got a diagnosis because I was, um, you, you know, shamed and pained so about you, that. So you found this it's, out pretty recently, right? Yeah. And, and the issue was at the time I lived um, near Issaquah and Issaquah has a big prescription drug problem. And so because I went to a nurse practitioner in that area, she assumed I was doing it to go, you know, sell the drugs on the street. And I'm like, no, I just, I just need help. You know, my, 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 my brain needs help and I want to have a better marriage and I want to be a better husband and partner. And I want to be a better person and I, and I want to be a better community member. So, um, so why did you wait so long to try to, you know, take care of this? Because I was afraid of that was going to happen again. I didn't want to be treated that way again. I'm like, I'm like, what are you talking about? I can like, I, I created a community event for 60,000 people. I'm not, you know, yeah. it, but, but they don't know. But my point is with the online, the problem is there are people that go and get multiple prescriptions and they are selling it on the street. And so with the online piece, that's the controversy is, are they doing a good enough job of getting those people out? And how, how do you tell? How do you know that those people just don't know the right things to fill out on a form so they can get a prescription and then they go to another website and get another prescription and, um, and do that? So, and I don't know a lot about that area. I just know that's, that's an issue. And the other big issue with so many people being not diagnosed is there's, you know, we always heard ADE and ADHD. And um, I still mention ADD because I didn't realize until I, you know, started dealing with this myself that they don't really use that anymore. It's ADHD is considered to have two different versions. And the ADHD we all think about is, is if I say that, if I say, oh, someone with ADHD, probably the first picture in your head is an elementary school boy who's running around the classroom and can't sit down, exactly. right? Is that what yep. you thought? Somebody bouncing up and right. down. So like, yeah. almost 100% of the times you think, well, what you don't think about is I have the, the, the other kind, which um, is m more common in girls um, than the other kind. And obviously some boys too, that that's happening in our brains all day long. So we're sitting in the chair and we're smart and we're answering questions. So you think we're like all the other students. What you don't know is that we are thinking about five to six things at any given moment and we're trying to figure things out and we're hoping to not forget stuff and we're trying to figure out systems to, to, you know, not screw something up or get the teacher mad or get the kids to make fun of us because we're sitting in, we're sitting there. So you don't see it. So you can see the kid running around. You can't see the students that have that going on. So it's getting, it's gotten better, but there are, um, a lot of uh, specifically, you know, women and girls that have not been diagnosed and now more adult men. Um, and I think entrepreneurship is one of the things that kind of drove that because I don't remember a time when I've been around startups where it wasn't a joke of like, oh yeah, I have ADD. I have ADD. Yeah. Right. Uh, it was always yeah. this joke of like, oh, I have ADD. Definitely hear that a um, lot. Because we do. Um and I think the more we're, we're open about it. And, you know, another thing that I'm going to be working on besides coaching um, the entrepreneurs who have ADHD is working on systems for employers to better identify and support their employees who have ADHD. Um, which they may, you know, they may notice somebody who doesn't, you know, know that they have ADHD and they're like, oh, I noticed you're kind of doing things that way um, and create systems that do that. So for instance, if you look at a job title um, and there's 20 things on it, maybe there's seven of those things that the ADHD person is really bad at 
and there's, you know, 12 or 13 that they're awesome at. So if you simply gave them a virtual assistant or you gave them a partner of somebody in the company who is really good at those seven things and they work together, now you're going to get the most out of that ADHD employee. They're going to be happier. They're going to be less stressed and they're going to stay longer, which is a huge deal right now um, because they're going to feel understood and supported. And you're going to let them do the things they're great at, which they're going to be able to hyper focus on and over deliver. on. Can you talk about how, like, this is, this is a very niche what you're doing, right? Like, how do you, how do you get this idea? What made you follow this? And then how you find your customers, like how you find your, 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 your people, so to speak. Well, I, I guess the second guessing thing is always there, right? So I got my master's degree in psychology in 2000. Um, I was the marketing director for Newfield Network um, Coach Training Institute in Boulder in early 2000s and went through their program. So I've had coach training and I've had that degree for a long time, but I didn't have the confidence to just go do it. And, you know, I knew that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't really know how to do it. And, you know, so I, I bounced around trying to figure out what else to do. I've done marketing forever because I love to connect people and help people. And that was the way I figured out I could make some money and have a career until new tech worked. And, um, you know, after three months of new tech, I realized, oh, wow. Um, you know, we had other cities and we can help people. We have people in a room that um, all these companies want to hire. And so they've got, I knew about marketing budgets and I came to Seattle and they're recruiting all these companies with recruiting budgets. So all we have to do is create value for the people who are here and, you know, the people with the marketing budgets and the recruiting budgets, we're giving them a way to connect with the community and, and help them find people to hire so we can, you know, have a business out of it and I can do what I want during the day instead of just kind of doing this on the side. How do you, how do you know, how quick is it take you to figure out that this, this person can be a match for you and like, and how do you like quote unquote fire a client, so to speak? Um, the, the match is generally pretty easy um, because what I find is almost 100% of the time, and I, I, I think 100% of the time so far, anyone I've talked to who has ADHD um, has not had these conversations. So they're starved. They're hungry. I mean, I, I actually you know, came from a, a lunch with a potential client you know, from a, a friend of mine that it's his co-founder and he's like, I want you to meet my co-founder and I think this would be good. And I get that, that same like look and exhale and they say, no one's ever talked to me about this before like this. And um, they don't necessarily, and like I said, it's, it's something that we're embarrassed about. You know, we're, we've been told we're wrong and made fun of I am not exaggerating every day of our lives since we were kids and people who love us do it and they don't mean to, but they, but they're confused because they, in their world, they're like, this is simple. I don't, I'm, why did you do this? I mean, my, my wife now laughs, let me give, give an example from yesterday. This is the second time I did it um, from when I did it weeks ago, I made the bed and you know, some people really love pillows. <laughs> And, and so we, you know, we have, you know, three sets of pillows, including the ones you put your head on. And I made the bed and I literally sat there looking at it for five minutes going, I don't, what's wrong. I'm like this, how come these are usually more together in the middle? They're not I'm like, I'm like, it looks right. It looks good, but I don't, I don't know, something's off. And I went downstairs and I was working in my wife's office is upstairs and then I got a text from my wife with a picture of it and um she's like so did you take your pillow this morning and send me a picture of the bed and I and I looked at the, the picture and I'm like ah, I put the pillow you sleep on on the outside again they're supposed to be in the middle <laughs> and I know that and I make the bed you know we both do it so you know maybe half the time or something so it's something I do all the time and I did that a couple weeks ago and I haven't done it but then here it is and it just randomly, you know, comes out of the slot machine today or yesterday. 
And, you know, she can laugh about it because we're in conversation about it. I mean, that's the thing is that you, you have to identify it, define it, and then create support systems. This is not a cure for this, is it? No. Okay. And, that, and that's the point. It's like, it's like finding out you have MS or something. And it's like, well, but so there's a whole other piece to this of like when, so when you find out um, you, and if you have, a, um, especially a non ADHD partner in life or business, there's generally a year. Um, is this, pass, I, is, this year, is this passed on through genetics? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and generally, um, you know, you go through the phases of grief because you, it, at first you're excited. It's just these conflicting things, right? So, okay, there's a name for this thing. Here are the things that, that I've had so much trouble with. It's not me, right? I thought I was the one person on the planet that's so screwed up. No, it's not just me. So the other people have this thing. It's got a name. There's, there's some stuff you can do to try to manage it better. Um, like I said before, you're never going to get more executive function. You're never going to get more working memory. And you can create systems and strategies and, and support knowing that. But you have to know it. Right? You have to admit it and know that it's there to go, okay, here's this thing. And it's always going to be here. So how am I going to make this thing better? And how am I going to live with it better? How can I, how can I actually be happy and have less anxiety and not piss off people on accident who I love and who I admire? And um, so you're, you kind of shifted into, I'm, I lost your question. <laughs> yeah. Your yeah. So um, it was a genetics and like, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it, it is genetic. Oh, when you, so when, so there's kind of a cycle of you, so you're excited because it's a thing and it's not you. And then you're heartbroken because what you just said, oh, this is the rest of my life. This was my entire life. Now there's, there's also split of like, okay, what do I do now to make it better? And now that I have this information, what do I do? Wow. If I, like I say, told you about the Ritalin pill, like, what if I would have known this when I was 10? What if I could have, you know, people would have helped me figure out how to manage it when I was 10. What other things would have happened in my life that didn't happen? What, what um, jobs would I not even have taken that I didn't want to? Or what jobs would I have not have gotten fired from? Or which relationships would I not have blown up because I did these things that were pretty much unconscious and then you know they can happen and then i go oh i'm sorry that's and it's it's really like a dr jekyll mr hyde thing of i don't you know i don't want to be that person and and i'm not that person i don't think i'm that person but then people in my life go you're doing behaviors of that kind of a person and it's like i don't want to be a defensive asshole but i just was an asshole and um and i didn't mean to be but I was, and the defensiveness and this stuff comes out because you've been poked at your whole life. And so somebody thinks it's this little thing they said, and they might even be meaning a joke, but you hear a criticism and that's your sixth one of the day. So that's the one where you blow up. And it's like, I, I don't want to be that person, but what do I do? Um, so there's, so then you got to kind of go through the, the cycles of grief of, um, you know, <laughs> denial and, so, and work your way through to acceptance and, and, you know, how, how you want to go forward with it. But then if you go forward with it and are forthright about it, then you to support yourself, even just with yourself of like, okay, well, what kind of jobs do I really want? Or what kind of company do I really want to work on? Or what kind of people do I really want to work with that can help you out? Um, there's one person I talked to recently that is young and, um, I think she's around 25 and um, hyper accomplished for her age and um, has ADHD and autism. And um, when, you know, somebody, you, we were actually, there was um, a virtual call we were, we were both on and, and it's a group that I've done stuff with for a long time. And you know, I'm telling people that I'm doing this 
you know, as a profession now. And I guess the, to jump back to your question, I'll jump back was I, I finally looked back and was like, look, this is what I've always wanted to do. If I don't do it, when am I going to do it? And with the ADHD diagnosis, what I dived into, I finally was like, oh, rather than just being a coach for entrepreneurs, this is, this is my thing. This I'm passionate about yeah, this. I have definitely. to learn more. I have to research. And, you know, yeah, it lights me up to help somebody with their business, but it lights me up even more to help them with their, their life and their brain, you know, what they go through every minute of the day. And are your and, clients in Seattle? You have clients nationwide? Um, just Seattle. Cause that's where my network is right now. And I, I mean, it's, it's kind of soft launch. Mm -hmm. So um, in December, my wife and I, launched a coaching company. She was actually into coaching before I met her too. Same thing. Like she was interested, but you know, hadn't done it. And so her focus is women in business and um, nonprofits and career advancement. And, you know, mine's ADHD entrepreneurs. So Brett, um, is there some, some kind of stat that says like, you have, you, if you have this, you're like 20% more likely to get a less paying job or 30% more likely, you know, like be like not do as good as you should. Um, I don't know specific statistics. I, I know that um, I have been told, but I haven't seen the statistic myself that um, ADHD founders generally fail more often and don't have exits or have exits where they get less for the company. Um, and I would guess it's the things we talked about before. If you're not really good with the paperwork and the organization and stuff, and you don't have that person, there's just things that are, you know, going to fall through the cracks. Um, that's the only kind of thing I can think of specifically around that. Okay. Yeah. Um, change subjects a little bit. Do y'all still do the uh, new tech job fairs? Well, we haven't <laughs> since COVID. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So pre-COVID, um, we were doing 52 events a year in Seattle, Tacoma, Bellevue, including um, quarterly job fairs with usually about 600 um, candidates and 25 to 30 companies ranging from startups to like Amazon and Microsoft, T-Mobile, Verizon, Oracle, kinds of companies. Um, so now we're at the time to start, you know, looking at it again. I'm just now um, putting together a fresh group of co-organizers and looking at um, how we go forward. Um, so we'll start those events again. So what, soon what is the future? For, what is the future for New Tech Northwest? Similar to what we did before. Um, so you know, at least quarterly events, possibly monthly, depending on what happens with the the co-organizers. I just I'm really focused on building up my coaching practice. Mm -hmm. But I want New Tech to be there for the community. So um, that's why I'm putting together co-organizers and city leaders mm -hmm. that can run it and manage it. And then I just have to make sure the quality control is there, that people are having the kind of experience we want them to have. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to have other people's input and have other people taking on some of those things and you know delegating those things that i'm not and, so good and, at and how do you find and these co-organizers people already knew your network or i just i sent an email out to our okay. list and okay. i have 12 people so far <laughs> and uh city of bellevue is going to mention it in their uh newsletter for me next week so we already have probably enough people but i have more and then i'm going to keep it open that'll be something we mentioned at the event so that if people are interested to be a part of it so that we can keep that going and i i think for new tech to continue to be valuable for people, we need to have um, young people with new ideas who are, you know, working at these companies or founding these companies to say, hey, this is what's kind of needed right now. Um, because that's a big part of what we do is we're, we're not about competing, as I mentioned before, or trying to be, you know, better at something someone else is doing. So that's why we're not going to have a pitch contest when everybody else, there's tons of places to do that. We're not going to have um, angel advice because, you know, we've had Seattle Angel Conference and Alliance of Angels. So I don't, I don't want to compete with them and do, you know, a, ha a half-hearted uh, option when this is what they do all the time and they're great at it. And I can tell you, hey, go check out, the, you have two different fantastic options um, to go get that information. So we're always looking at 
what's not being offered um, by other organizations in town that fits our mission to help people with the next step of their tech career or their tech company and put that together. And we'll probably have a little more education than before since I'm leaning more into coaching in that. What, what's your vision for your coaching company? Um, it's, it's evolving. So, I mean, so I'm about to roll out group coaching options um, for ADHD and um, mastermind groups for ADHD entrepreneurs so they can have peers with ADHD that are going through the same business um, issues. So similar to what I do with one-on-one -on -one coaching, it, it's kind of a two for one. <laughs> It's, it's business coaching plus understanding ADHD and it's, it's coaching on how to manage the ADHD, how to make your business better, and then how to have those two things work well together. Um, and as I mentioned, my wife has some different focuses and we're going to have groups in those areas also. So initially it's just kind of getting those off the ground and seeing what the demand is for those and how we do those. And then we'll kind of figure out how much, we want to just maintain for a while or, or scale. Um, so here's a question the you, you might not want to answer. You don't want to come to understand, right? <laughs> what are the pros and cons of working with, with your spouse or working with a spouse or two spouses working together? I think it, it depends on the relationship of the spouse. There's, you can talk, that's actually one thing that we're eventually going to do put as an option is uh, coaching for spouses who are business owners together because that that is a big deal but there's it just depends there's some where it works really great um the most obvious direct one is when there's let's you know say um i don't know what kind of business but i you know there's there's classic examples of that one person is really good at let's say the front of the house of you know doing the sales and being, um, getting the transactions and doing that part of it. And there's someone else who's really good in the back of the house at, you know, keeping the books and making sure the business stuff is there so that the cash flow is going to work. And they do that. So I think it's a, a big part of it is just being honest about the strengths and weaknesses of both people. And then together creating systems that work of who's going to do what so that it feels, um, fair. One issue that um, can come up that my wife and I run into when we had marketing companies was um, if I'm not doing business development, which looks like fun and meeting people, and she's doing a lot of the actual marketing work, you know, more of her share than she should have to do because I'm not doing some of that too, that doesn't work. So I, I think everything always starts with an honest conversation, right? Yes, and then yes. kind of, um, kind of renegotiating what's going to work because you obviously love that person and you obviously want to make things work well. And the best way to do that is to listen to each other and, um, try to understand what it's like for each person and then together figure out what's going to work that both of you are going to be happy as you're kind of moving forward with it. And there's people who say that they love, working with their spouse. And there's people who say, <laughs> Ooh, I could never do that. That have never done it. Um, yeah. And there's people that say, Oh, I can't imagine doing it with anyone else. Cause and for some people, it's just, they don't, the 24 seven thing doesn't work for them. It's like, Oh, at least one of us needs to go out to this job and come home at night. But um, for, for us, that's not the case, but for some other people it is. Uh, is there such a thing as a perfect client for you? A uh, perfect client is a entrepreneur or executive at a tech company that has at least 10 employees. And um, if they have ADHD, that's that. But I, I also have some clients who don't have ADHD and we just work on um, business coaching. And um, so it could kind of go either way that way. Why should someone get a business coach? Because you can't see everything and you haven't been there yet. Um, it, it, the, the biggest reason I think for any CEO or entrepreneur 
or leader that has a coach is because you really can excel so much faster if you have that person that you feel safe with, you feel supported by, you feel like you learn from them, they ask you the right questions for you to see the things in yourself either you don't see or you're afraid to take that risk and 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 go for it and um you can't you know they talk about it's lonely at the top and that's one reason why a lot of founders and executives deal with depression is if you're the ceo it's like mom and dad with the kids, right? You, you need, you can do, talk about whatever you talk about in the bedroom, but then when you walk out in the living room with the kids, they have to feel okay. So if you're a CEO and you know, there's trouble with the business, you can't, yeah, you, I mean, you, yeah. you may have nobody you can talk to you about really, that. You, you really can't tell your co-founders. Right. Either. Right. And you, and sometimes and there's, you should, you know, most things you should share with your co-founders, but yes, there are some things that, or maybe, it's helpful to have someone to work that out with before you have the conversation with the co-founder. So you can be really clear on your goals of the conversation and you can be really skillful in your communication so that that works out in a positive way. Yeah, what's your advice for someone to, like, to find a coach for them, right? Like for example, I mean, I pretty much get like three LinkedIn messages a day from coaches, right? Mm -hmm. We're the best coach for you. We're this, we're that, right? I'm like, your, your, it says in your profile, you're a financial coach, right? <laughs> you're not even like, no, no, you're like a big business coach, right? You're like, sure. like so many founders are get all these like unsolicited emails or LinkedIn messages. I'm the best coach for you. I mean, of course, that's not the way to do it. I right? got to be a relationship. Right. What, how does a person find a coach for them? Well, like you said, and there's a lot of fish out there in the water. <laughs> um, you know, my clients have come through people I know because I have, I, I, you know, I gather people together, so I have a huge network. Um, and so I, I, I guess what I would suggest is if you know people who have a coach, ask them about their coach or if their coach can ha has a referral. So at least you're starting with, you know, someone in your circle that is your friend or that you trust that you're assuming that if they're working with somebody that either that person's good or they're going to know people that would be good for you. And then any coach you, you check out should be giving you a free consultation because it's a very personal relationship. It's very intimate. And um, there's, you know, people that don't fit and, um, or they're not the best for you, depending on what their skill set is. You, you know, I've, I have the ADHD piece and, and I've, you know, worked with hundreds of founders since 2006. So there's a lot of things that I know within that there's somebody else who maybe came from corporate and they're better working with a leader who's in a corporation. Um, Cause that's their background. So I would think the best thing if it's a business coach is somebody who either themselves or they have clients that have succeeded where you want to go. So they've already walked that road. They already have that roadmap. And then the biggest thing is you need to have that free consultation to talk to each other and listen to your stomach because you're, you know, my, my one piece of advice I give everybody in, in life is everything, nothing we do is neutral, right? Every, every experience throughout our day, we either contract or we expand. It's, re it's real easy if we'll just stop and breathe and pay attention to it. So you know, have that conversation. And when it's, when it's over, do you feel higher? Do you feel like, oh, wow, they gave me things that are so helpful that I wouldn't have known before. Or do you're like, oh, I think this guy's trying to kind of, you know, figure out what I want and tell me what I want to hear. And sometimes there's personalities too. And there's, you know, you, you may work better with a man or you may work better with a woman or you may work better with somebody who's young, or you may work better with somebody who's LGBTQ and it's different for everybody. So the, you know, our, our, our guts are, they call it the second brain, but I believe I could be wrong, working memory, um, that there's actually more nerve endings in our stomach than in our brain. Um, and you know, 
right? You know, you when know. you like somebody or you, you trust somebody you know. or you feel like, in, and not to say, Lord knows, uh, there are really great con artists out there. We've we've all quite a few. We've all met them, and and sometimes we see them on on TV multiple times. <laughs> so we we know that there are people who can, you know, misrepresent who they are. But in general, if you have a half hour conversation, you have an idea. And I would just say, if you're looking for a coach, at the minimum go have free 30 minute consultation with three people and don't, don't just jump for the first person you talk to. And, and, you know, and when I have free consultations for, with people, that's what I tell them too. If they're like, Oh, this is great. We should do this. I'm like, I really appreciate that. And, and if I feel like it's, you know, going to be good too, um, I might still really want to work with them, but I said, you know, please go, go talk to two more people and see, because, what what matters is is what's going to be the best fit for you. And the truth is, there might be somebody who's great for you now, and then in a year, they're not the best for you in that place in life. Um, and if it's business coaching, there there are a lot of great business coaches. And the main thing is, again, if either they or their clients have already arrived successfully at the places that you want to go to, so they really have an idea beyond just being a good coach to ask the right questions and know what questions are going to help you find your own answers that they really kind of have a little bit of a roadmap that can, that can help you out with. So the soft skills and the hard skills kind of blended together. Is there anything I should ask you that I didn't ask you or anything else you want to talk about that we haven't talked about yet? Uh, I think this is great. <laughs> cool. It's I'm sorry if I rambled too much. No, no um, worries. No worries. But um yeah, I've, I've, I've really appreciated it and, and enjoy it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, Jason. No, thank you. Um, I'm going to say you have like a gift for our listeners. Um, I usually do a half hour free consultation. Okay. So um, let's just say we could give your listeners either a free hour um, of coaching. Um, and if they wanted to work with me and either one-on-one -on -one or join a group, then um, we'll give them 30% off okay, thank um, you for that. any kind of coaching they want. So the, the cabinet's discount. <laughs> yeah. And did you have a specific ask for the listeners that you need help with? Um, well, uh, I, I'm building the practice. So, you know, anybody who may be interested in either ADHD um, coaching, ADHD entrepreneurial coaching, entrepreneurial coaching for me, um, for my wife, she's an amazing Jill of all trades and has had a lot of life experience in different areas where she can really support women in business, um, a lot of nonprofit work and um, career advancement. So anyone who's interested in any of those kind of things, just go to epsilon and, um, you know, click the little contact button for a free consultation and uh, ask for the cabinet's discount. <laughs> yes. and, and, and can you share the rest of your social media links so people reach out to you? Sure. Um, so on Twitter, I'm at Brett Green. I'll be honest, I, I have a, a, like around 130,000 followers on Twitter because I started there early. I don't use Twitter a lot and my DMs have so much junk in them. I don't use them. Um, if you want to reach me, the best way is to either go to epsilon in the contact box or um, go to newtechnorthwest.com in the contact box and just shoot me an email through one of those two places. That'll see Twitter. I may not see it. Um, there's also at uh, new tech in W for new tech Northwest. And there is a new tech Northwest Facebook group. Um, and obviously LinkedIn and uh, LinkedIn, I'm linkedin.com slash in slash Brett Green, B-R-E-T-T-G-R-E-E-N-E. -E -E. And so listen, if we have the links to his gift and, uh, and all social media links on our show notes, you find the show notes at www.cabinetstateshowblog.com. Be sure to share this with your network and rate, subscribe, review the Jason Cabinet's experience. So Brett, any last minute advice or wisdom, anything you want to talk about? Um, I guess last minute advice is be honest with yourself of, of who you are. Um, if you think you need to be normal, you don't, um, there's a great Angela Milo quote about that, that I'm not remembering <laughs> right now. Um, 
most people are really amazing and too wasting way too much time trying to be normal. Um, so, you know, love yourself, take care of yourself, be good to people, be kind, um, any act of generosity or positivity every day, our, our world can definitely use and, um, you know, love yourself and take care of yourself and, and the people you, you love in your life. Brett, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.